how do you view the current state of affairs in terms of the generalized public understanding of vaccines? Oh, well, I view it as very troubled and mm. uh, troubled in, in, in two directions. I mean, I think we have for 15, 20 years had a fraction of people that have been vocally against vaccines. And mm. I, I worry they've done tremendous damage, I think, to public vaccination campaigns to around childhood immunization. And I've long been troubled about that contingency. I also worry that in the current moment, uh, while this mRNA and adenoviral vector vaccines are very good and can be used uh, for tremendous potential, I do worry that we run into the other extreme, sort of a vaccine absolutism, where we sometimes push them in very low risk populations uh, with very strict mandates uh, that may even do more harm than good. And so, you know, I'm somebody who studies evidence and doctor. I've given so many vaccines. Uh, I come in something in between. Vaccines, like any medical product, is a tool. If used wisely, can do tremendous good. Um, and if used, uh, misused, if pushed by commercial interests, if, ha if it has low levels of evidence, uh, I think it can do some harm. And I, we need to think about both those things. So it seemed to me like the shift really happened when the new variants made some claims that were broadly circulated and understood to be true suddenly fall. So in right. the early days, it was said, and I think in good faith believed, and was in fact true at first, that the getting vaccinated um, helped to prevent the spread of the vaccine. It wasn't just about getting it yourself to lower your risk of having the worst effects and having to be hospitalized and potentially die. But it was also about, it, there was this kind of community spread hook that motivated vaccine mandates. And at a certain point, when new variants changed that reality, the messaging didn't change with it. it, it does that feel accurate to you? Yeah, I think that's an uh, absolutely fair characterization. I mean, I think between December of 2020, January 2021, when vaccines were unrolling, and you remember, there were more people in line than we could give them out. You know, there was a mm -hmm. tremendous demand then. And then by May of 2021, that was when sort of demand and supply sort of met. That's when we started to get into sort of equilibrium. And I think in May and June of 2021, most people believed in good faith, as you say, that the vaccine was effective, not only at lowering your individual risk of bad outcomes, particularly the older you are and the more vulnerable you are, that risk reduction is even bigger, um, but also to arrest or slow uh, dramatically transmission for a benefit for third parties. I think by the summer of 2021 with the uh, Provincetown incident, we started to see evidence that there could be vaccine escape. And then with the new variants, particularly Omicron, we've had full-blown vaccine escape. And to your point about mandates, I think an ethical prerequisite to uh, mandates for vaccines or other personal health care uh, choices has typically been in biomedical uh, ethics that the vaccine does not just provide a benefit to you, but it also provides a benefit to third parties. And that benefit to third parties is so large that it justifies the imposition on your personal autonomy. And that's sort of been the basis for vaccine mandates. And one could argue that that basis eroded throughout the summer and into the fall of 2021. Um, and, and I think you're accurate in that characterization that the new variant did have a widespread vaccine escape. Omicron does have a vaccine escape for the original Wuhan uh, booster, um, which had been the predominant booster until just like two weeks ago. So the new booster is all the rage now. And that is really the focus of a lot of the attention now that the mandates are largely gone. I do know that the DC school system is the last one that had a, a mandate for students incoming, which you know I've discussed with Robbie a great deal on rising, so I won't go into more here. But the, the, the pivot seems to be for those who have legitimate concerns and those who have some more politicized concerns about um, the government's behavior in pushing various kinds of anti-COVID inter interventions is that the, the, the booster is the new line of defense. And you recently put out a, a video just a couple of days ago highlighting differences that you think are meaningful between the flu vaccine, which is the, the, the flu vaccine slash booster, which is what this is being um, compared to, and the COVID booster. Can you can you walk us through some of those differences on why you think that they're, they're meaningful here? Sure. And um, before I go through the differences, let me just say one thing, which is, you know, as progressives, I think we have to always embrace science and medicine when it improves the lives of other people. But I think we also have to be conscious that political forces and corporate capture can also play a role in sort of perpetual campaigns for medicines. And so two things can both be true. 
If you go back to January 2021 and you're a 60 year old unvaccinated person who's not yet had COVID, the benefit of you getting that mRNA vaccine is through the roof. It's a no brainer. You really ought to do it. And another thing can also be true, which is if you're a 20 year old healthy college student who got three doses of mRNA vaccines and then just had BA5 in the summertime, and now you're facing the new bivalent booster, it can also be too true that the potential benefit of that might be very, very small, actually currently unknown, we don't have data, and the risks might be salient, and we might wonder about the other forces in the world that would encourage that kind of vaccination strategy. So I think it's really important to hold both things in our mind, that this is a tool that's really useful, and also I think it can be overused and misused, and the company has every incentive to try to capture a tremendous market share in perpetuity. That's how Pfizer is going to be pulling down, I think, tens of billions of dollars for decades to come. So this current bivalent booster, why the controversy? I mean, um, I would say that one thing is the booster that's approved in the United States is 50% Wuhan, the original strain, 50% mm -hmm. BA4-5. The booster that was approved in Canada is 50% Wuhan, 50% BA1. The BA1 booster, that bivalent booster, that does have some human data, very limited, but it does have some human trial data. The BA45 and Wuhan, that was based, based on the ability to generate antibodies in mice. And not a lot of mice, but something like 8 to 10 mice. Um, that is a strategy that we have used for many decades with the flu vaccine. And with the flu vaccine, the idea is we don't know what strains of the flu are going to come to the North American shores in the winter. We can just make an educated guess. We know that flu is highly likely to mutate and change. And we make our best guess by looking at the Southern Hemisphere, by looking at Asia, Hong Kong, Australia, and we come to some conclusion that we think these two or three strains are going to play a role in the North American winter. We develop the flu vaccine in a traditional process, and, and we look to see, can we make antibodies against those targets? And then we deploy it widely. And then after the fact, we look with something called a case control study design to say, how well did it work? And the flu vaccine effectiveness, how well it worked, can vary in that study design, you know, rather dramatically. Some seasons it's low and some seasons it works better. That's why so many people you may know said, I got the shot, but I still got the flu. You know, that's inevitable. But we hope that on average people were better off as a result of that. This vaccine, I think, is different because it's not being developed against a strain that you think will be here in the winter. It's being developed against a strain that's already been circulating in the United States for quite some time, BA4 or 5. Um, we don't know exactly how many people, but maybe tens of millions or even 100 million people have been infected in the U.S. and globally with this strain already. So I think already that's one difference than the flu. Well, Other why, different, what, yeah, what, what, the, what the materiality of that difference, right? So why does, why yes. does that matter? I guess, I guess what it matters is um, I think scientists would say, you know, it is highly unlikely that if you had just gotten three doses and you had the BA5, and now you're one month after that, that giving you a vaccine against BA4-5 will give you a further benefit than what you've already accumulated by multiple vaccinations and being infected with that actual strain of Omicron. And that's different than the flu in the sense that we're not typically trying to vaccinate somebody with a flu shot immediately after they recovered from that exact strain of flu. So I think that's that's what I'm trying to point out as the difference. Well, what if I mean, even by the the larger end of the number that you put out there, you know, 100 million of us, a, th a third yeah. of the country or so having already gotten infected with this particular strain, Possibly. you know, would it would your opinion about how the flu shot, the, the booster shot was being recommended change if the recommendation were simply if you haven't gotten COVID in the last six months, we recommend you get a booster? That would be a tremendous improvement upon what their current messaging is. I would feel a lot better if they added if they added that caveat. And I think it would change some mandates at some college campuses. And I think that is, you know, what you what you just said there makes me a lot happier. Um, you know, I, I think that's an important nuance and carve out. They have been very reluctant to have any nuance in their guidance throughout this pandemic. They really want a one size fits all. And the other thing, Brianna, I'll point out is they are giving the same advice for a 15 year old as an 85 year old. And I also want them to say something like, you know, if you're if you're under the age of 40, we're going to say this is a you could consider it if you want, if you feel like you have an underlying medical problem, but we're not strongly advocating it. And if you're over the age of 50, we're, you know, or over the age of 80, we are very strongly advocating it. So I'd like to see that kind of nuance around risk. Um, that would also make me happier. Yes. So the, the, this is the, the age thing is something that I find myself personally confused about as well, because we saw higher death rates. Uh, hospitalization rates, even among young people, in a way that was very scary before the vaccines came out. And 
correct me if I'm wrong, but initial vaccine and the protection that it provided from some of the worst effects of COVID doesn't last forever, right? Well, so I guess it, I would, go ahead. Sorry, go ahead, please. <clears throat> no, I would say that um, the protection the vaccine gives you against severe disease hospitalization requiring oxygen does appear to last much longer than the protection it gives you against any symptomatic condition like a runny nose, sore throat, cough. So the severe disease protection does appear to be much more durable. It immunologically is, has different mechanisms, perhaps. Um, uh, and, and, and that appears to be more longer lasting. Um, but go on well, with your point. How, I mean, how, I mean, how long lasting is it is really the, the concern, because if it is a year, two years, three years, that's fine. But at some point, I think even younger and healthier people are going to be concerned enough to want to know when they should, in fact, get a booster. I, and I think that's a very important open question, because if you, as you point out, if we talk about the winter of 2024, 2025, and you start to see increase in hospitalization from COVID-19 in younger ages, then I think you have sort of one prerequisite to think about a booster campaign. And then I'd like to also see some evidence that, you know, additional doses will lower that risk. Um, and, and that might be an entirely different product that we're talking about because we're talking about whatever the circulating strain will be in the winter there. Um, right now, I think we are in a situation where at least when it comes to young people and even also some old people, uh, we are not seeing too many people being hospitalized uh, clearly with lung disease from COVID-19. The Omicron, in addition to being much more likely to spread, uh, the Omicron variant is also less likely to make you severely ill, you know, with or without vaccination. Um, so, you know, to bring, to put this all together, I guess I'd say that like so many things in medicine, there's no bright lines. It's just, you know, it's different slopes of risk. What are the things that we know increase risk? Getting older. And that risk is going up on a sort of a logarithmic scale. It's going up tremendously, but having underlying medical problems, diabetes, um, high blood pressure, being overweight, those are also salient risks. And I think medicine always when done well, considers all of the individual risks of the person in front of you. And my worry with the booster campaign is it doesn't do that. It's really sort of a one size fits all thing that doesn't really even allow a doctor to sort of customize the risk and benefit for the person in front of them. And so, I mean, if your point is that at some point, will some high risk younger person benefit from a booster? I'm totally persuaded that that might be the case. Uh, I don't, I don't doubt that that could be true. Uh, I haven't, you know, but is, is this the moment where we need to aggressively pursue it in even low risk individuals? Uh, in order to sort of hit those people, I, I, you know, that's that's where I struggle with. Yeah, that, that makes sense. But it also is a little unnerving to think that we won't know when we should all get hypothetically boosted until we see a spike in hospitalization rates and death. Among well, I have our another age okay, cohort. No, go ahead. Yeah, no, please. No, no, no that, that's a great point. But I, I would say here's how here's how I would push push down that issue. Pfizer has made a hundred billion dollars in the last year. Their revenue. This last cycle is driven by boosting vaccination and Paxlovid, which is also being used widely outside of what their studies have shown. We are handing them taxpayer money hand over fist. We have the ability and the federal government has the resources to demand that Pfizer perform a very large study in young and old populations. This, you know, we could be running this study as we speak month to month. They have all the resources and capital to do it. And we could even get an answer by November or early December, if we wanted, convincing answer that, hey, if you're over the age of 65 and you have these problems and you didn't have BA5, we know for sure there's a reduction in hospitalization. Uh, we, are not, we are not putting pressure on these companies to generate evidence. And, and that, to me, is a failure of the regulatory system. Um, and we could talk more about that. But I guess I'd say I, I don't think you even need to wait for the bad outcome. You can make them run the trial right now, knowing that it might be bad. And if it, and worst case scenario, it's good, but they're running it in a trial. So they're sort of um, keeping close tabs of everyone participating. Well, I, I, I guess I'm confused. I don't know. I don't understand how you do a trial on how long the original vaccine works without just waiting that out. It, Here's what I would do the trial. Mm -hmm. I mean, I would just say that right now they're going to just debut the vaccine. And then we're going to have to sort out the people who happened to choose to get it versus the people who didn't get it. Um, and that will be plagued with other problems, like the people who rush to get the newest dose are different in many other ways than the people mm. who are apprehensive or reluctant. But what I would say is that Pfizer could just randomize people to get it or not get it in the auspices of a very large study. Um, they always say the cost of the study is prohibitive. That's not an issue because they have tons of money. Um, and, and, just to see, and just to see if there, there's a benefit. And with a study, when it's big enough, you can even look for differences by age and underlying medical problems, et cetera. 
Uh, Paxlovid is another great example. You know, Paxlovid, they're making, you know, in the, the double digit billion dollars off Paxlovid. Um, they've only proven it works in people who are unvaccinated with other high risk features. For the ma vast majority of people who are taking the product, vaccinated, triple vaccinated, younger, you know, I am in San Francisco. I know people who are in their 30s who got it from, you know, you can find someone to give it to you. We just don't have any credible evidence. And so to me, this is something that's been a longstanding problem in medicine, which I think both of us uh, feel strongly about, which is that the corporate interest is to get you to use the product without proving that it works. Mm -hmm. and, and the public interest is to compel them to prove it. But I don't think we've done that. Just to back up just a second, are there no kind of bioethics concerns about a broad study of the type you you described where, you know, large numbers of people are basically told not to get vaccinated? Uh, I guess yeah. I would say there is always a concern like to tell someone not to do something if it's proven a benefit. Um, but in the current world, we're doing a study. It's an uncontrolled study. We're doing a study of millions of people based on who wants to walk into the study and they get the vaccine. There's no control arm. No one will be able to really know if they're benefiting from it or not. Uh, that kind of data collection is not as meticulous as in a study. And so, I mean, it, it's perpetually discussed in bioethics, which is, you know, is it ethical to do this trial? And an argument many of us make is, is it ethical not to do the trial? Because if you don't do the trial, you never know. And you have really subjected often 10 times or 20 times as many people to an intervention um, that then you would have had you done the study. Um, and so so that's how I would flip it is what we did with Paxlovid is an uncontrolled study that I still don't know the result, you know, and, and that to me concerns me. But yeah, the Paxlovid stuff seems a little bit wild. It, I think that from outsider, you know, people who are not kind of engaged with any kind of, I don't want to use the word skepticism because even that has become polarized, but it is. I think it's a legitimate skepticism um, about some of the vaccine policies. You know, folks who aren't kind of in the skeptic community saw the rhetoric about uh, Joe Biden getting COVID, getting Paxlovid, getting COVID again, and didn't really understand what that was supposed to prove to folks who have been saying what you're saying about Paxlovid being used by folks for whom it's not indicated, like President Biden, who is, you know, double vaxxed and boosted and all of the things. Um, and it is frustrating that what you have been saying so clearly here doesn't seem to emerge in broader discourse in a way that I think can be heard by some folks that are more in the liberal community who I think have been the victims of a certain level of propaganda about how sure the evidence is and the science is and how, you know, particularizing the advice is when in fact it's much like very, very overly broad for your description. And I, I wonder to what do you attribute that? Because it does seem like there has been some shifting around at the CDC and some acknowledgement that their messaging has been bad. But from your perspective, is it actually improving? So I guess what do I attribute it to? I mean, I think um, uh, I, I don't really attribute it a lot to the politicians who are in charge because I think politicians naturally rely on advisors and advisors are the people in whom uh, this medical information is filtered. Um, the advisors that politicians seek are often not sought because they are the, the best scientists, but they're sought because they are party loyalists or they're people who have previously spoken favorably of the administration. And uh, we can take, for instance, I don't mean to pick on him because I actually, you know, kind of like him <laughs> as a person. I think he's a good communicator, Ashish Jha. I mean, if mm. we're perfectly honest, Ashish Jha, uh, who I've followed his work for many years, he's a person who did a lot of work in Medicare and Medicaid data. He's a policy guy. Um, he became the dean of the Tufts, uh, sorry, of uh, Brown University School of Public Health. But the reason he is the White House czar is none of those reasons. It's because he was a frequent contributor on CNN. Uh, he's frequently on cable TV. Why was he on that? Because he did a lot of tweeting. And he was one of several people in whom the White House had previously given, you know, talking points as they were about to make decisions. And he has written op-eds that were laudatory of White House decisions like the day it comes out. And so to me, it seems like the way we pick medical people to give advice to politicians is we do a litmus test of who's loyal to us politically. And then we say, those are the people we're going to believe in. But these people may not always be the ones who are most cognizant about the issues that I think matter a great deal, conflict of interest, uh, medical evidence, uh, industry capture of, bio of, uh, of regulatory processes, and the revolving door. I mean, I think, how will we feel if Ashish Jha 
Rochelle Walensky, Vivek Morthy, how will we feel if they are on the board of directors of Pfizer and Moderna within five years? I will be deeply troubled by that, just as I am with Stephen Hahn and, you know, Scott Gottlieb, who's on the Pfizer board, a former commissioner of the FDA. And so I think we are creating a situation where the, po the political appointees who are making these decisions are fundamentally conflicted. Uh, they have a revolving door sort of politics. And, and I also want to make one more point, which is that we used to have civil servants as our guard. Uh, Marion Gruber and Phil Krauss were at the head and deputy and director of uh, Office of Vaccine Products at FDA. They are 25, 30 year civil servants. Those are people in whom I have great faith in because a civil servant who's been there for 30 years, they're you know less likely to be blown by the winds of political fortunes. Um, they're not there anymore. They resigned under pressure from this White House. That's what you know multiple news reports have said. So to me, why why is this happening deeply? I think, you know, it's very likely that they spend more time talking to executives at Pfizer than they do impartial scientists. I mean, realistically, the person who's working in the White House is taking meetings with Albert Borla, et cetera, and Pfizer. They're not taking meetings with, you know, the vast majority of scientists who may feel differently. Um, and the other thing is they're also sort of weighed by political consideration. One key political consideration is that you do not want cases to be spiking as you enter a midterm election. And even if you are doubtful about the safety efficacy, if it can put a dampen on cases, whether or not those are meaningful cases or not, that might be sort of a political gambit. But that's different than the public health gambit, which is you need to build trust, have long term trust. I mean, even to approve a booster based on eight mice data, that's not a good message to be sending in a climate of rampant anti vaccine sentiment. That's a very bad message. Um, so I, I want to come back to yeah. that. Okay. Yeah, go, I want to come back to that mouse point, but this political point is an interesting one. I, yeah. and I heard you make this on your um, your recent video. For one, it, there seems to be a little bit of tension between the idea that the booster might not really be that effect. You know, it, it, the cost benefit of it doesn't pan out for a lot of people, especially if you've already gotten COVID and recently. And this idea that because it will prevent a spike, it's being pushed right now. Which is it? Will it prevent a spike? And that's why the Democrats want people to take it right now so they will turn out in midterms? Or is it ineffective? I guess I don't know that to be true, but I just want to separate th maybe four things. One, sure. vaccines have effects on four different things. One, the asymptomatic carriage of the virus, how much it, you can swab someone's nose every day for the rest of your life and see how many times you got it. Two, having a mild runny nose, a cough, a sore throat, sort of a mild symptom. Three, vaccines can have an effect on you being so sick that, that it's, the, it's the illness that pushes you to the hospital. And four, vaccines can have an effect on death. And I think all of these four things, the, the right number of doses uh, might be different and the durability might be different. The first dose might give you huge impacts on death and hospitalizations and, and some impact on the first two categories as well. The second dose might improve all the categories, but like so many things in medicine, you can be subject to diminishing returns. You can keep, you could give somebody a dose every single day or every two weeks, you know, perpetuity, but at some point we're going to sort of hit the flat of the curve. And that might be very different for these four entities. I think what we do see across data is that the effectiveness against death and hospitalization that, la la that lasts longer um, is more durable than the effectiveness against any mild disease or asymptomatic disease. And so the reason I say all this is it's possible that it could be all it could be this it could fit this whole picture, which is that a 20 year old college kid who got whatever three doses, if you boost them right now, they may be less likely to test positive right before that election. But they're no less likely to be sick and hospitalized because that lit risk is already, you know, one in a million risk, you know, and it's not it's going to go and it's not going to go lower than one in a million. And so I think that when you're that person who's taking the vaccine, your thought is. Is it worth it to me in terms of my long-term health, you know, to get this? Am I, am I getting a net benefit or is the risk of things like myocarditis or other sort of vaccine side effects, is that, does that outweigh the benefit to me? And, um, and I think that's different than the political calculus, which is, which can weigh more heavily these sort of softer endpoints, if that makes sense. Yeah. So if you're, if you're a 21, the 20 year old kid, you know, you obviously don't, don't want to get COVID, but you're not so pressed about whether or not your timing of getting COVID happens to be around November. You're much more concerned about whether or not you have potentially some of these vaccine side effects, which I also want to come back to. But this mice point, I mean, they're mice. I didn't realize they were in such short supply. Why are these studies based on so tests on so few mice? <laughs> Well, I guess I'd say that. Um, I mean, sorry, the PETA people. Like, I know animals. I, I really am sorry. But like, yeah. 
<laughs> I guess I'd say that, you know, even though we poke fun of them for eight to 10 mice, it probably is very statistically sufficient to prove that the antibody titer is high. Like they're not going to do extra mice because it wouldn't give them any extra information. They're not following these mice to see how well they, how long they live or, you know, how well they do in their m mice lives. They're following them just to see after I inject them and I draw their blood, can I measure the tag or head of the antibody? The antibody is so high. And so they probably only need eight to 10 mice to be able to generate that data. So this, is, this is, this is another thing, doctor. It's like, if, if it is actually clinically valid to use a smaller number of mice, then why is the rhetoric, you know, they only used eight to 10 mice to advise a course of policy behavior? You know, the, the implication is that because the, there's so few mice, you know, they barely know what they're doing and they haven't tested on, you know, a more sophisticated animal that's closer to a human or humans themselves. You know, if, if you're saying the number of mice doesn't matter, then why are we even citing the number of mice? Well, OK, so here's how I put it. I say the number of mice is sufficient to say the antibody level is X, but Mice data is never sufficient to tell you what a drug will do in a human being. So I'll give you some mm -hmm. examples. You know, when it comes to mice and cancer, we've cured cancer in mice for since the 70s. Um, we know that a drug that's very promising in cell culture data or mice data, it still faces the odds that it'll come to the U.S. market and actually help people. We're talking about one in 10,000, sorry, yeah, one in 10,000, one in 100,000. So like the probability that, you know, there's a, there's a Twitter account that I think says called just uh, hashtag just say in mice, where you see a finding that says new study shows, you know, argon beam therapy cures prostate cancer. And then like he says, uh, but in mice. And the caveat means that like many scientists commonly joke about these mouse data because the gap between mice and man is, you know, is huge. I mean, it is a it is a huge gap. And I think the reason it's salient here is that, I mean, arguably, this is, I mean, arguably, the level of evidence has to be proportionate to the burden of emergency. So I was actually somebody who felt like back in the early, in the 2020s, when you had massive casualties, particularly in older people, I was willing to accept lower levels of evidence. The, the Pfizer and Moderna trials that came out, the primary endpoint of those studies was how many people had symptomatic disease. It wasn't how many people died of COVID or how many people had severe disease. They also happened to have favorable effects there. So that was very reassuring. But mm. the primary endpoint was symptomatic disease to try to speed it up. And I thought that was a very fair compromise. We were in the midst of an unprecedented emergency. You know, people were dying in tremendous numbers and we needed to expedite this to market. I think the situation in 2022 is dramatically different. If you go to our hospital, there are people with COVID, but very few of them are hospitalized from COVID. They often happen to be, they have a broken arm and they got swabbed and they test positive. And mm -hmm. as you get to a period of more tranquility, less of an emergency, I think that's when you, we, in medicine, we typically demand better evidence. Uh, we, add, we ask for a little more robust evidence. And so to slip to the mice data, I think that's why people lampoon it, is that the, we feel like, if anything, I want to see more credible evidence before I become, I mean, the real question is, what do you want to see before you go from 20 to 21 doses? I mean, Pfizer is planning to give you 21 doses in the next, you know, two decades. What kind of evidence will persuade you to get that 21st dose? And I think, if for me, it, it's not going to be in mice. I mean, I, at that point, I'm going to draw the line. It's like, I am not persuaded. I need to see some human data that this is actually helping people. So has there been anybody really pushing and advocating for the drug companies to actually do the kind of trials you described involving humans? Uh, no, I think that, I mean, Brianna, this is a this is a problem that transcends vaccines. This is a problem that comes to, you know, the last 15 years of policy around drugs and devices. We've had a number of pieces of legislation be pushed through from 21st century cures um, to uh, uh, re-upping the FDA funding. And in every one of these legislative bills, the pharmaceutical industry and pharma, their lobbying firm, have inserted provisos to further lower the hurdles for pharmaceutical companies to bring products to the market. Um, that benefits a lot of constituents. It makes a lot of people richer. It's one of the greatest ways to redistribute capital. Um, and and there have been very there there are very vocal but few people who have called for raising the standards of evidence. Um, and mostly university professors. What's interesting is that when I talk about COVID issues and debate them with my libertarian co-host on Rising, he often attributes people not being able to get the medicine they need to a backlog, uh, you know, administrative backlog at the FDA and these kind of government agencies, you know, keeping good stuff from folks because they are overly zealous regulators. And it's interesting because he's he's also on the side of being very critical of COVID policy and wanting there to be, you know, I don't want to like overly simplify his view, but generally speaking, 
less pro pushing boosters and vaxes on people and very critical of the quote unquote science as it's been put out there as, as indisputable by the CDC. And it, that, those things are obviously intention. Like you're, you're telling me that part of why it is that we have vaccines that are ineffective, or I shouldn't say that, that we don't know more about the efficacy of what is out there and aren't pushing people to drill down on what really could be beneficial is because there's too much largesse large or laissez-faire laissez attitude within the pharmaceutical companies because of uh, lobbying. I, yes. And so how do I reconcile this? I guess I'd say, and I know your co-host, Robbie, um, uh, I guess I would say that this is why I'm a progressive. I mean, I've written two books about drug policy, and both of them talked about ways in which the FDA should strengthen and improve and raise the regulatory hurdle. I've always been skeptical of the claim that we would have great drugs if the FDA would just be more lenient. Mm -hmm. I think we would have great drugs if science was easy. The reason mm -hmm. we don't have great drugs is science is not easy. Biology is hard. And the FDA being lenient, that's like saying, I'll run a faster mile if I buy a new stopwatch. I mean, that's not what makes me running a faster mile. It's just the regulator just calling balls and strikes. Um, so pre-COVID, I think I would probably disagree tremendously with your co-host uh, because I do identify as a progressive and that's always been the direction. I think good regulation actually makes us more free, makes us live longer, better lives. But with COVID-19 policy, I do deeply agree with your co-host, and I think some. And so here's the thing: reasons I think he's right. It's very volatile. I mean, the science is not settled on a lot of these issues. It's very live. Um, there are un, there are known unknowns, and there are unknown unknowns. To pardon the uh, the you know the old saying, um, but that's very true. And you gave one of them, which is that the probability that there would be an escape variant that really does uh, escape um, uh, vaccination, but that does have implications for policy and whether or not you should push on the mandate. Because, I mean, I was always critical of mandates for, for progressive reasons, because right. I felt like they'll have secondary spillover effects on, on existing vaccine campaigns. This is what the Europeans, the Scandinavians also believed. They'd have spillover effects on school attendance. If you, if you take a healthy child and keep him out of school, the damage to that child is so much greater than all the vax, you know, than, than this vaccine particularly. I'll, I'll leave it at that. Um, and, and so, and again, I have, I'm, I'm sort of sympathetic to your, your colleagues' views on masking, et cetera. Um, why? Because I think that, you know, we did get it with the progressive side. We got a lot of these issues wrong. I, I fear I, we were on the wrong side of school closure. We're on the wrong side of vaccine mandates to go to school. We're still on the wrong side of masking two year olds. We're against the World Health Organization there. And we're on the wrong side of like aggressively pushing a perpetual booster campaign, which is really the end game of Pfizer and Moderna and their stockholders without holding them to task. Um, and and so there I totally agree with your co-host. Yeah. yeah my, my ambivalence about the school closure bit is this. In the beginning, when before we had vaccines, I do think it made sense, like a lot of things made sense back then, because people were dying, not just being hospitalized in large numbers, but dying in large numbers. And although kids were not affected significantly, they were vectors. And I do, I, it, it frustrates me sometimes that the dialogue around school closures is always, well, kids aren't hurt. Well, kids don't live in a vacuum. And anybody who's been a parent or a teacher knows how frequently kids make you sick. So the argument back then was, you know, are you going to kill grandma? <laughs> like what if a lot of people live with older parents or older caretakers, grandparents, et cetera, I, especially lower income people where the larger families tend to be in one under one roof and people from various ethnic groups where that's more common. You know, is that really... Let yeah, me push ahead. on that a little bit. No, I, I, I totally agree with your, the premise of your argument, which is that if school closures protect parents and grandparents and other community workers, that's a legitimate consideration to be taken into schools. And then the other thing I'll totally agree with you is that in March 15th, 2020, there was incredible uncertainty around the virus and people who said we should close schools for two to six weeks, I think were totally justified. We just didn't know what was going to come. We had right. seen Ber Bergamo had just fallen. We had seen Tehran be uh, eclipsed with cases, et cetera. So I think I don't fault that. But in six weeks after that closure in Switzerland, they reopened. In Norway, they reopened. In Sweden, they never closed at all. Finland reopened very quickly. By the summer of 2020, I think that's the moment where I start to um, disagree a little bit. Um, right, by, sure. Yeah. So then, then by the summer of and then was it not the case, and I know that there are, there's always somebody somewhere in America that had an outcome and the entire news cycle will focus on the outlier, but wasn't it broadly the case that schools did reopen in the fall of, 20, in fall of 2020 post no, I don't think so. I think, I mean, Burbrio keeps statistics on that. And then mm. the places they didn't open were our places. They were like San Francisco. They didn't open for 18 months, Los Angeles. 
But Brianna, one more point about the, the transmission. Um, by the summer, late summer of 2020, we had um, economic analysis from Germany. Germany had something nice, which, or nice, which is good for a purpose of experimentation. Their summer closures were staggered, but their implementation of um, COVID restrictions was across the country. And so this allowed us to disambiguate school closure from COVID restrictions. And that paper showed that places that closed or reopened, there was no, di there was no measurable difference in community transmission. The folks from University of Southern California by the fall of 2020, they had another paper sort of documenting um, very minimal impact on community transmission. By the summer of 2020, Sweden had put out the increased risk to teachers, at, which was very small, if anything. Uh, one study showed no, ben no increased risk. One showed uh, that they had an increased risk, but still far less than taxi drivers and other sort of essential workers. Um, so to me, I think the failed moment was the fall of 2020. Um, ironically, you know, all the places that you know, I've been critical of for many decades, Florida, Texas, they were the places that reopened much more strongly than democratic stronghold places. Hey, YouTube. Thanks for watching. Just a reminder that this is a podcast. You can catch an extra premium episode every Monday for $5 a month at patreon.com slash bad faith podcast. That's patreon.com slash bad faith podcast for $5 a month, an extra episode every week. Additionally, please do consider liking this video, subscribing to this channel. It helps us out. It helps independent media beat the algorithm. We appreciate you. And as always, keep the faith.